Namaste. I'm Bill Ball, and I'm going to be your guide on this episode of Journeys in India. And this is India. When Mark Twain traveled through India at the turn of the 19th century, he wrote that India is the cradle of the human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of legend, the great-grandmother of tradition. Our most valuable and most instructive materials in history are treasured up in India only. Join us each week as we explore the entire Indian subcontinent from Kerala in the south to the Himalayas in the north and all points in between. We'll introduce you to the architecture, history, and culture of one of the most exotic, mysterious, and influential places on Earth. Journeys in India. Today we'll explore the cities of Jaipur and Udaipur. In Jaipur, we'll visit a local jewelry maker and take a day trip to the Amber Fort. Then we'll head to the romantic city of Udaipur. Here we'll visit one palace, stay in another, and check out the local art scene. Welcome to Jaipur, the first planned city in India. This is the state capital for Rajasthan and was founded in 1727. The city was laid out with sections set aside for government, shopping, schools and workshops. It only took four years to build the city from scratch. Jaipur is called the Pink City. But don't adjust your TVs. The buildings are really more of a rusty melon color than pink. They were originally cream colored, but when a visit by British royalty was scheduled, the Maharana went crazy trying and rejecting several colors, settling on terracotta. Today, all buildings are required to be painted in this way. This is Hawa Mahal, or the Wind Palace, a symbol of the city as much as the Eiffel Tower is to Paris. Built 200 years ago, there are 953 windows, and it seems to be the facade of a great building. But the weird thing is, the building is only one room about 10 feet deep. It's believed that the strange construction was to allow the women of the palace harem to view the activity on the street without having to be covered or veiled. Now that's treating your harem right. At the heart of Jaipur is the city palace, home to the current Maharaja. Inside there is one world record holding object that shouldn't be missed. These giant silver jugs are two of three that were made for the Maharaja in 1902. The Guinness Book of World Records lists them as the largest silver objects in the world, measuring over 5 feet high and 14 feet in circumference. But the sheer size of these items are only one reason to see them. The other is to ponder the amazing stories surrounding their creation. The Maharaja that ruled in 1902 was invited to King Edward VII's coronation in London. Remember, India was under British rule then. The local Hindu priests at the time would not allow Indians to travel abroad. Now the Maharana had to come up with an idea that wouldn't offend the priests or the King of England. He came up with a genius idea. He would take India with him. He went and gathered dirt from around Jaipur, spread it out on the deck of the boat, and each night he placed his bed on the soil of India. He also brought his local deities with him and prayed to him each day, just like he would at the palace. But most important of all, he melted down 14,000 silver coins to create these beautiful jugs. He filled them with the water from the river Ganges and drank only from those jugs throughout the entire journey. You might wonder what happened to the third jar. During the journey, a storm came up endangering the ship. The priest traveling with the Maharaja insisted that one of the jars be sacrificed to Varuna, the god of the sea. The Maharaja threw the jar overboard. It must have worked because they all arrived safely home. Now that was a sacrifice. Jaipur may be known as the Pink City, but with what goes on behind the doors in this neighborhood and many other neighborhoods in this city, you might better call it the Jewelry City. So let's go take a look. Jewelry making is a family affair in Jaipur. 
These goldsmiths are all brothers and cousins, and like many other industries in India, their tradition is passed from generation to generation. Layers of gold leaf are pressed into a mold by hand, creating the base for an elaborate pendant. All work is done by hand. There are no machines or computers, just skill and dedication. Like the goldsmith, down the street the silversmiths work at home also. Silver arrives here in raw form. The smith melts pieces of silver over this small yet intense flame, pours the liquid metal into a mold and waits for it to cool. Then he puts the metal into a press over and over, making thinner and thinner strips until reaching the desired size. This is about as high tech as it gets. Even the stones are cut and polished here. Working down the street, the gem cutter leans over his wheel, powered by a gas generator, and polishes the gems. These peridots will soon be set into a bracelet or a ring and reach the jewelry store case. This is back side, uh -huh. and this is front side. So same, this is we're doing a back side right now. The front is come after. The back of each individual piece is decorated as beautifully as the front. Let's take a look at the finished products. This enamel work was created here centuries ago and is still exclusive to the jewelry created in Jaipur. If you want to see the perfect setting for jewelry, you'll have to venture out of the city. Over 400 years ago, the founder of Jaipur and his father began building the Amber Fort. Today, you can still arrive like royalty, riding elephants up the hill. These are well cared for elephants. Animal welfare laws stipulate that the elephants can only make two round trips a day and if it gets too hot, the elephants get to go home. Don't worry, you won't get stranded at the fort. You can also come down by horsepower, engine horsepower that is. Jeeps are waiting at the back entrance to carry you back to your vehicle. The interior of this fort is amazing. This is the Ganesh pole or the entrance to the private apartments. Now that's what I call a front door. This palace was decorated with the most beautiful materials available. The finest Indian sandalwood was brought from the south and the most skilled carvers inlaid ivory creating door and window frames. No plaster wall stayed unadorned. Silversmiths hammered silver leaf into the ceilings. In the evenings, the flicker of oil lamps would dance across the ceiling, illuminating the royal apartments. And during the day, stained glass created dazzling carpets of light. Sometimes there's more to a decoration than meets the eye. My friend Naresh showed me the secrets of this flower carving. This is trunk of elephant. It's a fish. It's a fish. It's a tail of tiger. It's a tail of tiger, a crab, a crab, a lotus, and a scorpion. There was a lot of planning involved when building this fort. One of the strategic decisions involved the windows. Now these windows overlooked the courtyard where performers and dancers would be. The middle window was reserved for the queen, the two outside windows for his favorite concubines. Now here's the strategic part. The hallways behind them were designed so the women would never encounter each other when they came or went. You can spend most of the day exploring Amber Fort and still not see all of its treasures. Many are still hidden from view. When the Muslims conquered the area, they painted over any depictions of humans or animals. Much research has been done and small sections have been restored to its original beauty. Remember, when touring the palace, to look up, down, and sideways, because wonders are all around you.
At the end of a long day of touring, you'll want to know that there are comfortable rooms awaiting you. That is not a problem here. There are many options in Jaipur. In fact, several make the list of the top 100 hotels in the world. One is even in the top five. There are no worries then on finding accommodation suitable for Western tastes. There are standard rooms, rooms that are more than standard, and even luxury tents. Yes, I said luxury and tents in the same sentence. So whatever your tastes or budget, there are options that will not disappoint you in Jaipur. Most Western level hotels come with gourmet food. They usually have two choices, a continental restaurant and a restaurant serving local Indian cuisine. In this case, that would be a traditional Thali platter. I met with Adrian Meller, chef of the Raj Mahal restaurant, to learn a little bit more about the tradition of Thali. Raj Mahal is a Thali concept, which is a home-style Indian um, preparation of food. It's basically, for a Westerner, it would be a, a tasting menu, Indian style, where you get um, eight, ten dishes that you can taste um, through an experience of Indian cuisine, from tandoori to soups, vegetarian, it's all in there. And then to finish, we have a, a dessert platter of three Indian desserts. There is no better way to end the day than with a meal fit for a Maharaja and some local entertainment. A short flight 250 miles southwest lands us in the town of Udaipur, a city like no other. It's got it all. A magical beginning, amazing architecture, an immense palace, and romance. The best place to start is at the beginning, and the beginning is like a fairy tale. Udai Singh founded the city of Udaipur. He was a Mewar, part of a long dynasty of regional rulers. He lost his kingdom to the invading Mughals. These Central Asian warriors could trace their lineage all the way back to Genghis Khan. Udai Singh was a king without a kingdom. He was hunting in the hills near here when he met a hermit. The hermit blessed him and told him to start over and build a palace. Udai took the hermit's advice and began building in 1559. To place this in context with the rest of the world, this is the same year the first Queen Elizabeth came to the throne. It was the year ice cream appeared in Italy, and it was the year tulips were brought to Holland from Turkey. Anyway, the palace and the family are still here today. The Maharana occupies one wing. The rest of the palace is open to the public as a museum. The highlight, and one of my personal favorites, is the courtyard of the peacocks. The detail on these mosaics is incredible. And when the sun dances off the mirrored tiles, it looks like the peacocks are actually dancing. The amazing thing is that these mosaics have withstood over 100 years of exposure to the elements. Obviously, the Mewar loved objects of great beauty, and that tradition continues today. Virtually every region in India is known for a certain craft. Jewelry, stone carving, wood carving, in Udaipur, it is painting on silk and camel bone. I went to visit one of the top schools of silk painting to learn more about this unique artwork. Here at the school, there are apprentices and masters. The apprentice will work many years copying historic paintings to obtain the skill level and the title of master. The apprentices learn to paint on silk. In time, they will paint subjects with more and more detail. Once reaching the level of master, artists design their own paintings and display more creativity. They are also allowed to paint on camel bone. 
a work that requires tremendous skill and great detail. You can get paintings at all price levels. Apprentice work is the least expensive. An apprentice painting on silk will cost about a fourth of what a master's work on silk will cost. A painting on camel bone will cost three to four times what a silk painting will cost. The architectural gem of Udaipur is the Jagdish Temple, which was built about the same time as the colonnades were around St. Peter's Square in Rome. The temple is one of the best examples of Dravidian architecture. There are two easy ways to identify the Dravidian style. First, the central tower is a square or rectangular pyramid. And second, the tower is covered with sculpture. In this case, the sculptures are dancers, horsemen, elephants and musicians, but other animals, deities and warriors are also common. The main shrine to Vishnu is in the center of the complex. Four smaller shrines are at the corners. In 1651, when the temple was built, it cost about 1.5 million rupees. Now that's about $37,000 in today's money. In the 1600s, that was a fortune. But it was money well spent, because even today, it is still the largest temple in the city. Remember, when you're visiting temples and mosques, you will be asked to remove your shoes. There is usually someone from the temple that looks after your shoes while you're visiting. If you're wearing sandals, you may want to carry a pair of socks for such visits. Oh yeah, and don't forget to give a small token of appreciation to your shoe attendant for a job well done. In the mid-18th century, the Maharana received a gift that most men would kill for. As part of his wife's dowry, he received 48 ladies-in-waiting. Now, where does one put such a gift? In a beautiful garden retreat, of course. The Garden of the Maids of Honor provided a place for the ladies to bathe and walk unveiled. All of the fountains are gravity fed and no pumps are used. The gardens were built lower than the Fata Sagar Lake, which supplies the water. It may seem that these fountains are on continuously or triggered automatically as you walk by. However, everything is controlled by a garden staff worker and a pressure valve. The water is not the only feature of these beautifully maintained gardens. The statues were created by master carvers whose work only adds to the stunning oasis. Bougainvilleas, which can be seen throughout India, are quite plentiful here. And while not native to India, they have taken to Indian soil. The plants are actually native to South America. In 1768, French naval officer Louis Antoine Bougainville saw the plant in flower and was the first to describe it to the Europeans. The rest is floral history. And if you want a little alone time, escape the hustle and bustle of the city with a visit to the Lake Palace for a tour, a meal, or to stay the night. In the middle of Lake Pachola sits one of the world's most unique hotels. 300 years ago, this was the summer home of the Maharaja, where he and his family could escape the summer heat and relax. Even today, you can only reach the Lake Palace, or Jagniwash as it is more properly known, by boat. Come on, ma'am. Come on, sir. Welcome to Lake Palace. 
Because this was built as a palace, every room is unique. Each room is individually created from the decorations to the art and to the antiquities. If you want to visit or have a meal, call ahead to reserve a time and the boat will get you there. Some of you may recognize the Lake Palace from the James Bond movie, Octopussy. One of the climactic chase scenes was filmed at the hotel. Because of its unique and beautiful setting, it's considered one of the most romantic hotels in the world. I spent the afternoon with a local chef who took time to teach me a few of his signature dishes. Seasoned tomato puree, spring onions, some ginger. And a humongous lobster. Small dices. And some seasoned tomato puree. So we can put the lobster here. And place it back into the shell. There is no better way to recharge your batteries than a good meal. As you see, even when you're not a fan of Indian cuisine, you can have many other options. Udaipur is famous for its specialized dancing. Many believe that this was the origin of the European gypsies, as the dances are so similar. The entertainment starts as the sun begins to fade. On the balcony, dancers spin and swirl to traditional music. As the night descends, the dancers move into the courtyard where a fabulous light show projects the dancers on the wall. With all of the amazing things to see and do, it would take several days just to scratch the surface. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. The city of Jaipur is known for its pink buildings. Wander around and enjoy the unique look of the city. Hawa Mahal or the Wind Palace is not only pink, but an architectural gem. Travel outside the city to the Amber Fort where the Maharajas lived in style. The opulence remains centuries after the rulers have moved on. Jaipur's incredible jewelry makers create unique pieces ranging from perfect souvenirs to perfect for princesses. The talented painters of Udaipur create beautiful scenes on silk. Choose a traditional scene or a truly unique piece of art. Relax among the cooling fountains of the Garden of the Maidens, where the fountains will compete with the flowers for your photos. Trace the history of Udaipur at the magnificent city palace. Still a functioning palace, plus a museum and an art gallery. You can spend half a day here exploring the grounds. I'm Bill Ball, and I'll see you on the next episode of Journeys in India.